Thank you so much, Dr. Dharmendra. So, uh, since this is Insulin Symposium, the idea of putting these two topics was essentially because, uh, you know, we all have been using insulin for a long time, but somehow, in spite of the best of our efforts, there are challenges and a biosimilar insulin and then a generation two insulin. Both of them have their own place in therapy when it comes to overcoming these challenges. So when it comes to a biosimilar, the, the quality of insulin delivery at a reasonable, affordable price is the USP of using a biosimilar insulin. But when we move on, when it comes to the Gen 2 basal insulins, this is where we may feel that it is expensive. But if you look at the benefits that these offer, then the cost does justify when it comes to the benefits that you get with these designer insulins. So, so again, uh, my uh, um, confession, this is a sponsored talk. So when it comes to glycemic control with insulin, we all know patients with type 2 diabetes at some point in their progression of disease will eventually need insulin treatment, which means initiation of insulin and then intensification of treatment. Because the whole idea is not only to achieve good glycemic control, but to prevent complications and give them a good quality of life. So therapeutic inertia is something that kind of, in spite of initiation, prevents the patient from reaching targets. Now, this could be physician-driven or this could be patient-driven. So even if we at times initiate insulin, we do not intensify. And that is why patient is not able to achieve good glycemic control. And a very important reason why we are scared of intensification is because of the fear of hypoglycemia. So the moment you start thinking of insulin, Besides the point that it's an injectable, hypoglycemia becomes a major concern because we know that hypoglycemia is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. And the risk increases multifold when it comes to a frail elderly patient or patients who have comorbidities, for example, somebody who's got renal impairment, etc. This is where the second generation basal insulin analog, Glargine 300, provides comparable glycemic control with a lower risk of hypoglycemia compared to the other basal insulin analogs that are available. Now, this is something that I just talked about. Various studies clearly showing that hypoglycemia is a major barrier when it comes to achieving optimal type 2 diabetes management because it is common, though underreported, in a lot of patients with type 2 diabetes. Mild to moderate hypoglycemia increases the risk of injury from falls or accidents at times and recurrent hypoglycemia, especially severe episodes, can increase cardiovascular events as well. Again, when it comes to the elderly and the frail, we know hypoglycemia risk has to be kept in mind whenever we're thinking of any particular therapy for them, especially those with renal impairment or multiple comorbidities. So that is where the choice of insulin and the dosing has to be very, very proper. Now, this is where the second generation basal insulin analog scores over the conventional or the first generation basal insulin analogs, as you can see here on your screens. All the guidelines now clearly recommend that basal insulin analogs are much better, far superior when it comes to reducing the risk of hypoglycemia as compared to the conventional NPH insulin that all of us used decades back. The improved PKPD profiles of the second generation basal insulin analog, Largin 300, are associated with lower risk of hypoglycemia when you even compare it to the first generation analog, which is the U100 Glargin insulin. And this ideal PKPD profile of a basal second generation, as you can see here, a much flatter and a much longer duration of action with much less glycemic variability and a longer duration of action. So I'll, I'll not bore you with all the theory because I'm sure all of us have been using the second generation basal insulins. What I'll do is I'll run you through a few clinical cases that we commonly encounter in our OPDs and see how the generation two basal insulin comes to the rescue for these patients where we have those challenges. So my first case is patient A who is uncontrolled on multiple oral agents. Now this is a 52 year old gentleman Diabetes duration of six years. He's a delivery driver, so drives around a lot. He has got irregular working hours. Now, his BMI is 32. You can see a renal function pretty all right. 90 is his GFR. He is currently on 
all the OEDs that you can think of. So he's already on an optimized dose of metformin, one gram twice a day. He's on glimipride, two milligrams twice a day. He's already on an SGLT2 inhibitor and a gliptin optimized dose. And for his hypertension, he's already on an ARB and for dyslipidemia, he's already on a statin. He's got hypertension. There's no established CVD in the family. His father did have type 2 diabetes and died of an MI. So the patient is worried about potential weight gain with insulin when you talk of insulin. He was given the option of a GLP-1, but he could not tolerate. So that's why GLP-1 is not on board. Now, his current A1C is 8.2% and it's been almost in the similar range almost the entire year. But again, whenever the topic of insulin comes in, he's reluctant because of the inconvenience of taking insulin because he's got irregular working hours if he has a delivery in the morning or in the evening or late night. So taking insulin at that particular time becomes a difficult problem. And like I said, he's a driver. So, you know, with sulfonylurea and then adding an insulin hypoglycemia concerns are something very, very important here. Now, let's take a step back and see what the, is the evidence when it comes to choosing an insulin with this patient in mind. Well, First is the flexibility of taking the insulin. So compared to a U100, which has to be taken at the same time every day, Glargine 300 can be injected in a three hour period. So you have a window of taking it three hours prior or three hours after the usual time of this once daily efficacy administration without any effect or change in its efficacy or safety. Then you have these four studies which actually bring you back to why you can choose this insulin for this particular patient, the take control study, which clearly says that compared to a physician-led titration, if you empower your patient and you educate him on self-titration, Glargine 300 resulted in superior HbA1c reduction without an increase in the risk of hypoglycemia. So that means if you can initiate and teach him how to titrate the dose, the risk of hypoglycemia becomes much less. Again, we have the addition 3 and the BRIGHT trials. Both of them clearly showing that Glargine 300, when compared to Glargine 100 and IDEG insulin also, did show comparable glycemic control with much less hypoglycemia, especially in the initial titration period. Because, you know, during titration, if a patient goes into a severe hypoglycemia, sometimes the compliance becomes difficult and he'll completely go off insulin. So that is one good advantage here. And furthermore, when it comes to the weight gain concern, again, you see that over six months of Glargine 300 use, weight increase was negligible, hardly 1.4, 1.6%. Then even in insulin naive patients, the real world evidence through the deliver naive clearly shows initiation of Glargine 300 in comparison to Glargine 100 was associated with significantly improved glycemic control without an increase in hypoglycemia. So empowered with all this knowledge, I think we can be convinced that we can add a, uh, an, uh, a U300 for this patient and maybe reduce the sulfonylurea dose and eventually later on maybe discontinue the sulfonylurea because the second generation analog offers relatively low hypoglycemia risk, good efficacy and dosing flexibility for this patient. Of course, it's important in material of whatever therapy we give, whenever we are intensifying therapy, don't forget the role of lifestyle and diet modification, which need to be reiterated at every visit. Again, like I said, it's important to guide and train the patient on regular SMBG, which has to be performed essentially on a daily basis if possible. So as to titrate the insulin doses, especially in this case, because he's a delivery driver. So hypoglycemia has to be avoided. So that's very important. And now we all have SMBG and AGP CGM technologies available, which can largely help these patients to achieve good glycemic control. And like I said, revision of his HbA1c target. So he's already uncontrolled. You have to tell him that his target has to be less than 7%, of course, without hypoglycemia to ensure a tight glycemic control because this man is young, does not have established CVD, but his father did have a MI. So with that, let me move on to the second case. This is a female, 61 years old, diabetes duration of 10 years, BMI 31. Currently, she's already on a U100 Glargine, the first generation basal insulin analog, 28 units HS. She's also on an optimized dose of linagliptin, empagliflozin and metformin. She did try an, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, but eventually discontinued due to the high cost and we all encounter such patients on and off. Her HbA1c is 7.5 and she seems to be pretty satisfied with it at her age. She has no CVDs, 
she does have confirmed nocturnal hypoglycemia with maybe one to two episodes every two to three weeks, which result in maybe fatigue in the day. She is concerned about hypoglycemia, scared of a severe hypoglycemia because she lives alone and drives to work and has a good social life. She thinks that she's on HbA1c target, 7.5 at her age seems to be reasonable to her. And she thinks that, you know, since she's already on target, can she stop insulin? So now let's go back and look at some research evidence here. Now, Deliver 2 was a real world evidence which showed that patients with type 2 diabetes, if they were switched from U100 to U300, the incidence of hypoglycemia became much less. And this was exactly the same benefit was achieved, whether the patient was on a degludec insulin or a detimer insulin or even a glargine 100. So any switch from first generation basal to a second generation basal, hypoglycemias became much less. Now, addition two was an RCT. Again, in people with type 2 diabetes and controlled on basal insulin and OADs, where compared to glargine 100, glargine 300 arm, Patients showed less nocturnal and anytime hypoglycemia. And the lightning real world evidence, which clearly shows that treatment with glargine 300 was associated with lower rates of severe hypoglycemia in comparison to glargine 100 or detimer in patients who were switched from another basal insulin. So, for this patient, what do you need to keep in mind? You need to tell her that type 2 diabetes is progressive, she does need insulin and glycemic control does not mean that she's in remission and she can stop insulin because obviously if she stops insulin, there is definitely a huge probability that her glycemic control is going to worsen again. Furthermore, since she's confident, she's already on a basal insulin, all you need to do is switch her to a generation two where the hypoglycemia concern can be addressed, giving her a good efficacy and tell her that for her, even a target of 7% is equally good. You know, she need not stay at 7.5. She does not have any comorbidity. So you can probably aim for a better intensification. This is where second generation basal insulin analog will help because it reduces the risk of nocturnal hypoglycemia as well. And of course, she needs to adjust the dose based on her uh, glycemic uh, control based on the SMBG values. And sometimes if she's scared of, you know, a nocturnal hypoglycemia, maybe Switching from an evening to a morning administration can be considered. You need to educate her on hypoglycemia self-management and recognizing situations when hypoglycemia may occur, which means telling her to eat on time and small frequent meals along with regular SMBG. So with that, let me move to the third case. This is case uh, patient C, an 80-year-old elderly gentleman, BMI 27, who's had diabetes for 16 years. Of course, you can see he's got mild renal impairment, GFR is 64. He's also got peripheral neuropathy, pre-proliferative retinopathy. So the microvascular complication gamut is already there. There is a slight beginning of dementia for this patient. He's got hypertension and lipids which are well managed with treatment. Now, this patient is on a DPP-4 inhibitor, metformin and SGLT2 optimized doses. Now, his caregivers are unsure on whether his glycemic control is adequate or inadequate because they are scared of hypoglycemia impact. They are concerned for his safety, worried about the complexity of starting insulin and are therefore reluctant to start insulin injections. Now, this is where we need to go back and look at the data that is present in the senior age group. So you have the senior RCT where Glargine 300 demonstrated good efficacy and safety in people who were more than 75 years of age with type 2 diabetes. And there was documented less symptomatic hypoglycemia and documented less severe hypoglycemia in Glargine 300 arm versus the Glargine 100 arm. Again, the addition 1, 2 and 3 RCTs clearly showed similar glycemic control to Glargine 100. Again, and with a lower incidence of nocturnal hypoglycemia irrespective of age. So even if it was less than 65 or more than 65, you see the same results. The bright RCT again showed that glargine 300 in comparison to the degludec 100 showed good greater HbA1c reduction without an increase in hypoglycemia in people with type 2 diabetes who are more than 70 years of age and starting a basal insulin analog. So this patient, of course, needs better glycemic control because his blood glucose levels, you know, are high. He's already got neuropathy and retinopathy. And, you know, these could be detrimental to his complication profile. Furthermore, he's got an onset of dementia. And we know that hypoglycemia also can worsen his dementia. So you need to start a basal insulin analog. But you need to give him something that does not give too much of a hypoglycemia. Start with a simple titration algorithm as is recommended by the ADA. 
This is where Glagene 300 gives you a relatively simple regimen to improve glycemic control with a risk of hypoglycemia that is lower than the first generation basal insulin and the other second generation basal insulin analogs. So for this patient, educate this patient and his caregivers to enable them to manage his diabetes using a pragmatic A1C target of at least less than 8% and home glucose monitoring, which is very, very pertinent in this case. My last case, this is patient D, 68-year-old gentleman, 20 years of diabetes, BMI 30. Again, you see a compromised renal function. He's at a stage 3A CKD with 40 GFR. He's got background diabetic retinopathy. He's already on metformin, empalina. He's uh, uh, on a statin and an ARB and a calcium channel blocker for his hypertension. GLP-1 was not tried due to a pre-existing gastritis on and off. His A1C, as you can see on your screen, is 8.8. Now, of course, this lady is worried about her glycemic control. She's never been on her target ever since she was diagnosed. So she's been on pretty uncontrolled diabetes. And no doubt, she's landed up with uh, CKD and background retinopathy. She's particularly uh, worried about her complications now. And she's worried for her eyes and for her kidneys. Now, what does the research evidence say for such patients? This is a post hoc analysis of edition 1 to 3 randomized control trials, which clearly showed glycemic control with glargine 300 was comparable to that with glargine 100, but with lower rates of hypoglycemia in patients with type 2 diabetes who had mild to moderate renal impairment. So again, you see a safety data here. The deliver high risk study found that in people with type 2 diabetes and mild to moderate renal impairment, switching from another basal insulin to a glargine 300 resulted in similar A1C reduction and less hypoglycemia compared to a switch to the first generation basal insulin. And again, a post hoc analysis of the BRIGHT randomized control trial found that glargine 300 use was associated with greater reductions in A1C compared to degludec without increasing hypoglycemia in people who had type 2 diabetes and impaired renal function. So what do you need to keep in mind when you are looking at this patient? Of course, you need to intensify her glycemic control because you need to stop the CKD progression. Since she is already on a metformin and STLT and may not tolerate a GLP, next step, of course, would be offering a generation 2 basal insulin, the glargine 300 insulin. She should be educated on diabetes self-management, managing hypoglycemia risk and dealing with hypoglycemic events, if at all it does occur. You should review the recommendation for medication use on days when she is unwell. So if the basal insulin is initiated, she may benefit from continued treatment on such days with increased blood glucose monitoring and adjustment of doses as required. And for her, a pragmatic target would definitely be anything around 7 to 7.5%, which may be more appropriate compared to where she is today. So friends, to sum up, there is a strong evidence for Glargine 300 use. You know, you have the PKPD studies versus Glargine 100. You have the addition program. You have the Deliver and the ATOS real world study. So you have RCTs, you have real world evidence. You have a combination of each, both on comparison to the first generation or the other uh, basal insulins. You have the patient experience studies. You have studies clearly showing much less hypoglycemia risk with the U300 insulin. When you compare it both to Glargine 100 and both to insulin Degludec, the one case study clearly showing you the real world evidence in type 1 as well, the Bright study in type 2 and the real randomized control trial in range, which clearly talks of less glycemic variability with Glargine 300 in comparison to Degludec. So to summarize, Patients with type 2 diabetes will eventually require a basal insulin to achieve or maintain glycemic control and we should definitely not delay this. Second generation basal insulin analogs such as a Glargine 300 represents a suitable basal insulin option for people who need insulin initiation and then intensification of their antihyperglycemic regimes. And improved communication is the key. So you need to empower your patient, educate your patient along with appropriate tools and support which increases the patient's confidence when it comes to starting insulin and titrating insulin doses to achieve optimal glycemic goals. With that, I think I will end and stop sharing and we can take up some discussion.